All right. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Lai Sang Yang. Lai Sang is a professor from the Crown Institute at uh, New York University. Her research focuses on dynamical system theory and applications in statistical physics and computational and theoretical neuroscience. So today she will share with us some of the related work about direction selectivity of the monkey V1 cortex. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, so the, uh, the main results that I would like to present today are on direction selectivity uh, in the monkey V1 cortex. And that's going to be the second half of the talk. Okay. In the first half, I would like to say different things that would kind of build up to that. Okay. So for the uh, last several years, so five, six, seven years now, I have been working on trying to understand the macaque visual cortex through theory and modeling. And the macaque, as you all know, has a visual system that's very, very similar to ours. And the reason that is ideal for use for uh, studying theory and to, for modeling work is that there's a, a, a lot of data have been uh, collected for the macaque. So we just, it, it's already there. Okay. So uh, I'm going to, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I'm going to assume that not everyone is an expert in this area. And I'm going to start with one page worth of our, our neurobiological background. Okay, so this is the, obviously the, the profile of a human face. The, so as uh, visual information comes in through the retina, it goes directly to the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus, this knee shapes uh, uh, object. And then from there in one synapse, it goes to the back of the head, which is where the visual cortex is located. Now the visual cortex is divided into different regions, not exactly like this. This is more a picture of it. If you take this really crinkly uh, piece of neural tissue and flatten it all out, but it doesn't really look like that, okay? So it's divided into V1, V2, V3, and so on. And V1 is what I'm going to be talking about. It's called, also called a primary visual cortex. This is the entry point to cortex. So all the information passes through <clears throat> V1 before going to the higher cortical areas. There are the different cortical regions uh, associated with different functions. So V1, for example, is where the first time that edges at specific spatial locations are identified. V4 is associated with geometric shapes and forms and V5 with motion and so on. But uh, these uh, cortical uh, areas are unequal. V1 is far and away <clears throat> the largest and the most complex um, and many of the properties are actually initiated in V1. It's just that the receptive fields for V1 are so small that these functions cannot be completed. So they are completed further downstream. But so V1 is many things really start there and it's not fair to think of it as really just edges. So, uh, so once again, the information comes in from retina to LGN to V1 and, and then to, to the higher cortical areas. And the blue part, LGN to V1, is what my talk is going to be focused on. Okay. I'm going to skip over retina and just go directly to LGN. Okay. So two more things that are general kind of uh, things that I should say about V1 is that there are two distinct visual pathways. They are totally distinct on the level of LGN, uh, somewhat distinct, uh, more or less distinct still in V1, called the Magno and the Parvo pathways. The Magno one is the one that I'm going to be modeling. It's, uh, it's, it's very sensitive to contrast. So at low contrast, it's mostly your Magno pathway that's working. And the, it does not have color as the Pavel one does. The Pavel one is also better at details, but it requires more uh, contrast for it to function well. Okay. So, and then one other thing is that the cortex, this entire uh, sheet, neural sheet, is actually divided into many layers. What you see here is a picture of V1. You can actually see the layers of cells under the microscope. Uh, so it, people say six or seven layers, but then each one has got A, B, C, D in size. So I don't, uh, it's, it's hard to say how exactly how many there are. One merges into another. And most of these layers, uh, the, the cells, there are some of the layers of different cell types. And they also, there's a lot more lateral connections than uh, inter interlaminar connections, okay? So you see this really dark band, this corresponds to one layer, okay? So 
um, th this is the uh, uh, overall picture. And the topic of today's talk is that I want to explain two things, how cortical cells in the macaque acquire their orientation and direction selectivity. So a uh, very quick introduction to what these, um, what these uh, things are, yeah. is that the, so there are two very basic properties of V1 neurons that I didn't get to say in the last slide. Uh, actually, I sort of said that. One is that each neuron has a very small receptive field. So each is meaning that each neuron receives direct information through the retina uh, only for a very tiny region of the, of the visual space. Uh, the moon is about half a degree, and you can think of the receptive fields as about a, a quarter the size of the moon. It's very roughly speaking. Or people also say that you hold up your, your thumb and nail in front, and it's a little bit smaller than the size of your thumbnail. Okay. So that's one fact, a very small receptive field for each neuron. Of course, then all the different neurons piece them together. And the second thing is that there's a retinal topic map, uh, uh, meaning uh, essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, in a nice uh, continuous way between the, your retina and the visual cortex. Okay. So the spatial locations are very well uh, marked out in the visual cortex. It's like you had a map of, the, of what the retina sees. And hey, okay, so orientation selectivity means that most neurons in V1 have orientation selectivity. And orient the orientation selectivity refers to the property that each neuron has a preferred orientation. It means that in its tiny receptive field, if it detects an edge that it likes, so in this case, it's this or orientation, then it, it, it's, it spikes a lot. If you move the angle away off a little bit, then it uh, fires less. And if you move it farther away even more, then it fires even less, okay? And so these are very well-known things, the tuning curves that people make. So meaning that it's been centered at zero. Uh, in this particular angle is when the neuron prefers and then prefers the other ones less and less. So this is one of the properties that I would like to talk about. But the main one I'd like to talk about is direction selectivity. And direction selectivity, DS, says that in this, so it prefers this orientation, but the bar could be moving from left to right or from right to left. Okay? And some neurons, not all, some neurons strongly prefer one of the directions, meaning that it, it, it reacts a lot when, 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 when it sees a bar moving from left to right, but not from right to left, okay? in, in the direction of his preference. Okay? So these are the two properties. And the main thing to know <clears throat> here is that uh, LGN, has no orientation selectivity or direction selectivity, okay? Uh, but the cortical cells, even in the input layers, already do, okay? So the, I'm, the layer that I'm gonna talk about is the input layer, is the layer that receives direct information from, uh, from, from, from LGN, okay? And so, it, and, the, and there is absolutely nothing between LGN and V1. So the cells here in one synapse goes there, these properties are not there, but it's there. So uh, what I'd like to do is to explain how uh, cortex acquires these uh, capabilities. Okay. So the way that uh, we went about doing this is this kind of triangle of ideas from data, you motivate the development of theory, you test it in models, model you compare the results with uh, model outputs with data and back and forth like this, okay? So I'm gonna be mostly talking about theory today, okay? With a little bit about the model, and I'm, I won't be saying anything about the data other than to quote it, okay? So let me first tell you what the model was like so that, because most of the talk will be on the theory. So the model was constructed uh, in collaboration with Bob Shapley, Mike Hawken, and Logan Charker. These two are uh, uh, neuroscientists, mostly experimentalists, uh, and Logan Charker is postdoc. Okay? So these are, uh, so, so the model, this is just, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a grading, but it, it is a light intensity map. So there is a, since uh, the magno, the layer 4C alpha is the input layer in the magno pathway. So since there is only, there's no color, so it's very simple, it's really just luminance. So um, the, the G of X T is the, it, it just tells me at location X as time T, how bright, uh, the, the, what the luminance is. So there's a map that comes in. I'm skipping over retina 
in the magnal pathway, retina and LGN are quite similar. So I'm gonna uh, go straight to LGN, okay? And so the model, our model is a very small piece, as you can tell, this is only three quarters of a degree uh, in, in visual, in, in everything is measured in degree at, at the angle that is subtends in your retina. Okay, so, and then from LGN, it goes to the input layer, therefore C alpha of the magnal pathway. Okay, and in, in terms of actual size in the visual cortex, this is about half a millimeter. Okay? So this is mostly what we're interested in, but uh, one thing that we cannot ignore, we found, is that uh, layer four C alpha actually interacts with layer six. Layer six interact of V1 interacts with lots of layers in, in V1. You cannot quite ignore that. So there's some back and forth uh, feed, feedback from, from, from layer six. Uh, so this is mostly what the model is about. We've tried to uh, uh, do the network structure and the, and the wiring following neural anatomy as much as possible. And so what do we have so far? Um, so so the, I, I, I'm not gonna get into these things. I just want to kind of run it by you quickly. Uh, we have more or less matched the firing rates and that's not one thing, but under, under many conditions like spontaneous, driven, optimally, orthogonally, and so on, okay. Uh, we've modeled contrast response, the tuning curves for orientations, spatial frequency, temporal frequency, uh, uh, and direction selectivity, simple cells versus complex cells, gamma rhythms, etc. And all of these things are in one model. And I want to emphasize that because all of these things have been modeled before by lots of many, many authors. And what we've tried to do is to put them all into a single model. Uh, this is very important for us because uh, for me, the purpose of modeling is not so much to just build a replica of the real thing or some simplified uh, version of the real thing, but something that could actually tell us about, it's not so much to, 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 to reproduce the known, but to answer questions about the unknown. And in order for the answers to make sense, the, the, the model better uh, behave properly. And these are ways that we try to make sure that it's not doing anything too crazy. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we have, the, the model has all of these, uh, properties. And uh, one more slide on the model is that, um, so we, we have tried to use the correct cell density for layer 4 C alpha, <coughs> as well, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the connectivity. We try to follow anatomy whenever we can. And in particular, there are no long range connections in 4 C alpha, uh, a fact that made the modeling much simpler. So this is roughly what it looks like. Okay, so if you take an E cell, and you, so, so first of all, it's on the order of about 4,000 cells per square per hypercolumn in, in, in this, according to cell density measurements. And if you take an E cell, uh, the peak connectivity is about 15% and it dies out like a truncated Gaussian. We try to follow the length of the axons and so on. And these, then these dots are randomly drawn in, within those constraints. And it adds up to on the order of 200 E to E cells. E cells um, going into uh, synapsing on an E cell. If you take an I cell, then it has a lot more E cells. But if you take either an E or an I, the I cells usually come from very close by because their axons are much shorter. Okay. So it's, th these are the kind of numbers. It, they, they're not so important to us. I just want to show you uh, what kind of things went into the model. And we use integrated fire neurons in, uh, in in, okay, so we normalize the units so that V is membrane potential. And this is the standard leaky integrated and fire equation, which says that the uh, membrane potential would fluctuate. And when it reaches one, we have normalized that one, uh, it will fire a spike and then get reset to zero. Okay? Um, of course, it, this should be translated into something like minus 70 millivolts and so on, but zero and one is easier for us. Uh, and so, the, 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 is the main thing that's important for this talk is that the membrane potential changes um, according to the three forces. One is a leak, meaning if nothing happens, it will leak down to zero. And then there's an excitatory force which drives it up to some imaginary point up here called a reversal potential. Uh, but of course it never reaches there because when it reaches one, it already fires the spike and gets reset. And then there's an inhib inhibitory force would drive it down to this imaginary point. And these forces are 
the distance to the reversal potential and times conductance. And conductance is just something that gets elevated by for a few milliseconds whenever it receives a spike. Okay, so this is uh, the, uh, um, so maybe, uh, sh sh uh, are there are there questions uh, at this point before my going on? So okay, then now let me go to the or uh, let me first explain say something about orientation selectivity before going to direction selectivity. So th these are some well known facts that I'm repeating. Okay, the first one is the hypothesis of Hubo and Weasel. Okay, and they they hypothesize uh, through through. These, these are, of course, giants in electrophysiology in the 60s. And they found that each cell uh, it receives either two or three rows of LGNs on and off, uh, alternating on off LGN cells, okay? And this leads to a receptive, some, some separate regions in the receptive fields corresponding to the on and off. And so and these rows, are uh, very neatly aligned in certain spatial directions. And that direction uh, is the direction that the neuron prefers. Okay. So this is something that was found by, proposed by Hubo and Weasel and um, has been essentially checked out by, uh, in, in uh, mappings of receptive field maps. Okay. Second fact that's very uh, uh, good to know is that, um, is that the, neurons that have preferred the same orientation tend to be grouped together. So this is an imaging, I think that this is an optical imaging of the, a piece of real cortex and the color codes uh, tells you which orientation it prefers. And so you can see that they, uh, they, they're, the ones that prefer blue tend to be grouped together, red tend to be grouped together and so on. So these are the two main facts that are uh, well known about orientation selectivity. Um, I thought that before I get to uh, our model, I should mention the first model. This is the ring model was one of the first models that was presented that in, in tried to involve some, uh, some, some part of the physiology. It was uh, Ben Yishai, um, uh, Bauer and Swambulinski about 25 years uh, ago. And it's a mean field model. It says, well, look, uh, you can see that the orientations are organized in the form of a, uh, around some, some, some singular point. So let's think of that as, a, think of this thing, which is what I, I'm gonna call a hypercolumn as a ring. And so parameterized by theta at the angle and M is the activity level. So I can write down how the activity level changes and it changes where there's a leak term and then there, it takes the total synaptic input and a gain function modulates how much that affects the activity. And that's the equation, okay? And the total synaptic input is there's an interaction term and then there is the external drive, okay? The external drive is modeled as a cosine function in here. So basically, if you think of uh, the uh, angle theta as being activated, then you give you, 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 you give like a bump, uh, 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 you give a lot more drive near the theta zero and it tapers off uh, um, like, like in a cosine function. So this is how, how this model was, was, was. So the drive means that you give it more, more spikes in this model. Okay, so now I'm getting moving on to uh, um, the model that uh, we have been building. So first, a uh, little bit of information on the structure and dynamics of LGN. Okay, so LGN comes in separate sheets. And this is just one of the sheets. And it consists of two uh, uh, types of cells on and off. Okay? And each, they, they just form two uh, mosaics overlaid on each other. And the on cells are excited when the receptor, so the LGN cells also have very small receptive fields, uh, roughly the same size as the, the, the uh, V1 cells. Okay? The uh, receptor field, goes from dark to light, then the LGN cells, the on cells get excited. So on means dark to light, off means light to dark. Right? So these two cell, kinds of cells are, LGN is really, so, so if you talk to people that work with the visual system uh, for monkey, at least, they will tell you that LGN is really quite simple. Retina is also not as simple, but not so complicated either but then cortex is much, much more complicated. Okay. 
um, so this is so LGN here has these two types of cells, and the input current is this is uh, we borrowed it from uh, earlier modeling. It is receives a current that's there's a background current, and then there's a light intensity map. Okay, so th this is the the, the allocation x at time t. What what is the luminance? And then you convolve that with a spatial kernel and a temporal kernel, okay? And then you, you take the positive part and that's the current that it gets, okay? Uh, so the spatial kernel is roughly a Gaussian. This is a, as function of radius. So it's two dimensional, okay? Um, so is retina is two dimensional, okay? So this, so this is roughly uh, a Gaussian. Actually, it's a difference of two Gaussians. There's some sur surround effect, but for our purposes, just think of it as summing up the stuff nearby. I'm, I'm not gonna pay a whole lot of attention to this uh, for, for purposes of this talk. Okay. And then there's a temporal kernel. The temporal kernels look like this. It's got a positive part and a negative part. Okay. And uh, that's very interesting because most of the time when you convolve with a kernel, the kernel is, is, is something that involves like averaging something like a Gaussian that averages something nearby. But this one is like a sine wave function. And I think of this as taking derivative, right? So it, it is really looking at what you see here minus what you see there. It's like taking derivative without letting the delta t at the bottom go into zero. Okay? So for this reason, LGN cells are change detectors. That's why if you give it a single gray background, it's not going to fire, but if you, but by, by chain, it's when a de derivative detects something that it fires. And this is, uh, one is for on and the off one is uh, in the opposite direction. Okay. So I've only drawn one of them. So this is all that I'm gonna use about LGN. And then we try to put all of this into the model. And I just want to mention one problem that we ran into right away. And this was the, our first uh, crisis <laughs> trying to uh, put together this model was that we found that the extreme sparseness of LGN in the magnal layer. Okay? It was kind of surprising to us that, uh, in, so what corresponds to a quarter by, degree by a quarter degree, okay, which is one hypercolumn, there are only roughly 10 LGN cells, five on, five off. And this is the same for multiple sources. Okay? In the Pavel one, there's, Pavel one is very dependent on where you are uh, distance from eccentricity. The Magno one around five degrees, 10 degrees, three to 10 degrees is roughly the same. It's, uh, it's uh, so, so the, for, for, to cover the area that's a quarter the size of the moon, you only have 10 cells, five on and five off. That's a little bit scary about how those so few cells can tell you so much, right? But then when trying to do them, and th these results have been around for a long time. They, so one, counts, uh, one counts retina, one counts LGN, other ones trace it backward from V1 and so on. So the multiple results there. Okay. So, um, so, so what are the problems when we try to do that is that it's really hard to find two or three rows of on and off among so few. And not to mention to have to try to represent that around the clock. Okay. And also there are constraints on the separation and so on. So we weren't sure that it could be done or not. But anyway, cutting long story short, we found that it could be done, but barely. There's not a whole lot of room to spare. Okay. But it, it, we couldn't meet a lot of experimental conditions using this few cells, but barely. Okay. okay. So now getting to the mechanics. Okay. So the uh, so so let's say that I have a I have a V one cell and is connected to these four uh, um, LGN cells these two on and two off okay so this this the V one cell is optimally driven meaning it fires the most when the grading is aligned with so the grading is vertical and aligned so a lot of things are tested using grading so that's why we tested the theory too using gradings okay so when the grading is aligned with these with, with these uh, rows, uh, uh, <laughs> rows of two uh, of, uh, of uh, LGN cells, okay? And that the separation is also roughly the same. So that, so for example, when these two cells are around this edge, so when the grading moves, it's going from light to dark, so they get very happy. And if the black one is exactly here, 
then when the gradient moves is going from, uh, well, sorry, th this one is going from dark to light. So these two are very happy. These two are here. So it goes from light to dark and it's very happy. So they're all excited simultaneously half of the time and they're not stimulated the other half of the time. Okay? As opposed to if you turn the grading 90 degrees, uh, going, going from top to, let's say horizontally going up like that, then uh, they're always excited the same amount all the time. Okay? So to summarize, what is, it, what, is it, what, what is well known is that when the cell is, so, so I'm, I'm telling you things that are known, not, not, not anything new here. It's, it's more like, uh, it's kind of motivates what I need to get into. Um, so, when the, so when the cell is optimally driven, it fires a lot, a fraction of the time, and then it's silent. This is what the cell receives, okay? This is the LGN spikes that's coming in, not the response, okay? So the LGN spikes that are coming in, a lot of them comes in half of the cycle, no spike come in the other half a lot and then none because if you look at these two they are kind of all four are happy nobody is happy all four are happy nobody's happy it kind of alternates like that whereas when it's orthogonally driven then everything is the same kind of throughout and the fact is that this input pattern uh, elicits a very strong v1 response whereas this input pattern elicits a much weaker v1 response okay now, I want to stress that it's the same number of LGN spikes in these two conditions, okay, right? Because uh, why uh, the, the, the V1 cell, it, un, unlike the ring model, which says that the cells that are optimally driven receive a lot more spikes and the ones that, that are not receive no spikes, here, the number of LGN spikes received per second is always the same. That's because you are hooked onto these four cells, the same four cells, each LGN cell individually does not see, does not know orientation. So it must respond exactly the same way, no matter what grading you show it. So as a consequence, independently of what direct orientation the grading is, the V1 cell will get the same number of spikes from that LGN cell per second, okay? So in other words, the number of spikes here adds up to the number of spikes here. It's just a pattern that's different. Okay. unlike the, the, the ring model. Okay. So let me show you how this, what, what this leads to in, 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 our, in our model. So yeah, th this is the model that I showed you before. Okay. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a picture of this now. Okay. And this is the, uh, the, the, this is the uh, Im imaging of uh, real cortex showing the orientation domain. So what we did in our model is to divide it into square hypercolumns, each one of which have uh, divided into intended orientation domains, meaning that if this part is given the vertical bars, this means that it's intended to uh, prefer vertical, doesn't mean that it will, but in the sense that we're gonna connect it to LGN cells uh, that are aligned, uh, that, that, that with the rows of, uh, of which are vertical. And this one will be connected to LGN cells, uh, horizontal rows of LGN cells and so on, okay? So this is kind of the whole model. I've told you that uh, we, we, we just cut this up and then we, we make the connection to LGN and LGN does what I told you that it would do. And so here are uh, some of the results that we saw that, okay, so, so zero here means vertical and the uh, color means firing rate average over one second and the bright colors are high firing okay and the top row is e bottom row is i you can see that they are roughly the same okay uh, so the way i would read this is that okay zero so i'm pre i'm presenting uh, a, z uh, a vertical grading to it so in the vertical gradings well so i go to this this is the key the key says vertical grading these are the regions that are supposed to prefer vertical grading Okay. And so they are the, these are the regions that are hooked up to vertical rows of LGN cells. And lo and behold, the directions, the, the, the locations more or less match. Um, this was like the, the model is uh, computing these things by, by themselves. Okay. So I don't really have much control over the neuronal interactions inside, um, inside the 4,000 neurons per square here that's computing. Okay. And okay, uh, what if I go to a 45 degree grading? If I go to 40, again, I go to the key for the map and I say, okay, oh, well, I don't see a 45 degrees here. 
but I see 30 and 60. So it must be the somewhere in between 30 and 60. And if you go look up there, you it does match the 30 and 60 one. Okay. So the 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 uh, the model uh, performs correctly with regard to uh, orientation selectivity. Um, so was maybe a word about E and I. E and I always co-vary. So when when E is high, I is high. That's of course uh, as expected because. The, when the E cell spikes, it stimulates not only the nearby E cells, but also the, all the nearby I cells. But the I cells have much higher firing and are broad, more broadly. You can see how that it's more broadly tuned. It doesn't taper down to zero. It goes down to something much higher than the E cells. The E cells dip much lower, closer to zero than the I cells. So they're more broadly tuned, uh, also consistent with experiments. And uh, if you look in just the central hypercolumn, as the uh, orientation of the grading changes, you can see that it moves around like this, okay? Not, uh, not completely cleanly, nor should it be, but this is the connectivity, right? So it, it's, it's uh, this cell is, we just drew, drew randomly uh, according to the connection probabilities in the literature, uh, what, what, uh, uh, what the connection probability should be. Okay, so I'll show you a little um, movie. Uh, so this is exactly the same thing as before. This is the E, this is the I cell. Here, this is a time. I have uh, slowed down the time by a lot uh, so that it doesn't give anybody an epileptic seizure. The thing is that it's flashing around really, really quickly, milliseconds. And um, so the main thing I want to emphasize is that um, I don't go in to touch the model. We give it the we give it the stimulus, and then it computes the rest uh, on its own. Okay, so in in following the way that the, the integrated fire neurons behave and how they are coupled to each other and how the, the connection to LGN and how LGN behaves. So in other words, we put into the model what we think is uh, what is going on in. Um, in uh, how the individual components behave, put them together, present the stimulus and let the model compute, okay? So the, you, the grading will change as you, will, you can check to see if I'm right. And the, the, um, so now it's vertical, okay? In a moment it will change and it will be the different part that gets uh, So I've taken some convolutions both in time and in space, so just to not to make the thing not so jerky. Otherwise, it's flashing like uh, it's really crazy. <laughs> so this is kind of like uh, a version of fMRI, uh, if you like, on the neuronal level. Okay, um, it it uh, because it's a model, it can obviously be as uh, as <clears throat> as detailed as you want. Uh, the resolution can be as high as you want in spatial or temporal, um, but both spatial and temporal resolution. But uh, I have I have uh, kind of smoothed that off a little bit. Okay. Uh, would anyone like to ask something before I go to direction selectivity? Oh, I guess I'm not ready to go there yet. Okay, so. I, I want to address a couple of issues. Okay, so a couple of issues. This you, you've seen this one. I want to explain why do spiking ma uh, patterns matter? Okay, so why is it that it responds so much to this kind of LGN patterns, but not so much to this? And there's another thing I want to explain is the feed forward versus intracortical input. So the early thinking uh, uh, spearheaded by Hubo and Weasel, but subscribed to by many others, is that in sense in the sensory cortices at least and possibly other places too is mostly feet forward okay? and the lateral um, modulation is re relatively minor compared to the feet forward signal okay? but the modern view of this has completely changed and people measuring the amount of currents that go in what they found is that the the lateral is actually has the biggest current feedback is in, in the case, in our case, it's smaller than lateral by quite a bit, but sometimes it's bigger than lateral, okay? And feed forward is actually very small, usually often very small. They, these relations are not always like that, but it's often like this, okay? 
And so in particular in the model, the LGN current is roughly 10% of the intracortical current. So why does so little feed forward input have such a big effect? Okay. Um, so it's already so little feed forward, so little current, and also only differing in spiking pattern. Why do these, why, why is it that we can have, uh, or why is, why is the cell uh, uh, so good in discerning orientation? And so I want to mention this because this is kind of relevant for everything else, is that the, the, if you look at a cell, it could be an E cell or an I cell, and look at the E current that goes into it, the total E current that goes into it, and the total I current that goes into it, it looks like this. The, the two are very, 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 very close to each other in relation to the magnitude of the whole current. Okay. And so one way to see this is that if you go back to the integrate and fire equation, um, ignoring the leak, okay, uh, leak, ignoring the leak term and you integrate, what you get on the left side is that, so in, instead of letting, resetting, I keep integrating. So I, in, in, in T seconds, I basically add up the number of times that it fires in T seconds, right? So on the left side, if I integrate, I get firing rate. And on the right side, I get the difference between E current and I current. And I current is uh, assumed to be positive, so I can so I can draw it like this. Okay. Well, but the E current. Let's say that this is E firing rate. Now E current, you can you can estimate this is the number of presynaptic E cells, the E firing rate, the coupling weight, the distance to reversal potential. So you can put these things together, and in a reasonable circuit, meaning that you use reasonable coupling. The distance to reversal potential is fixed, more, more or less fixed. The, the, if you use reasonable numbers for coupling, ours are guided by data. And if you use reasonable uh, circuit size, ours is also guided by data, then you will find that this number to get this number E current is a lot bigger than that number. Okay. So if you have a number on the left, that's a difference of two numbers. And this one is, this one is a lot bigger than that. That conclusion is these two are very close. Okay, so that this is I'm not saying anything more than this. It's really just the integrated and firing neuron. Okay, now uh, as you all know, there's a very well known balanced state theory uh, pioneered by Van Riesek and Sombolinsky uh, long before this, and they studied something more delicate. They studied the exact balance as the system size uh, goes to infinity, okay? And there are some other uh, conditions. So uh, whereas, uh, so, uh, so this is a more elaborate theory, okay? What I want to emphasize here is that without assuming anything, without taking system size to infinity, okay? Just looking at the integrated fire uh, uh, neurons in a reasonable size circuit, you would already get approximate E balance for this, this is the proof, okay? It's really realistic coupling and reasonable circuit size. It follows directly from integrated fire equation. Okay. It's not exact, it's only approximate. But I want to emphasize also that uh, I don't want it to be exact because the current difference is exactly firing rate. Okay? So I actually want to know that it's approximate, but I, don't, I want to know the, the gap, that gap, because that gap is firing rate. Okay? So, so the consequence of this is an unreasonable effectiveness of external drive. Okay? Reason, the reason is that when they are so close, you don't have to send in a huge amount of current. You just send in a little bit of current to, once you disturb this gap, then uh, you will create, you will cause the firing rate of the V1 cell to differ by a lot. Okay? So this is how, how I understand uh, why this input, uh, feed forward input so small can have such a big effect is the unreasonable effectiveness of external drive. Okay? Another reason is there is recurrent excitation in, in the visual cortex because the uh, uh, neurons that prefer the same orientation are grouped together. Locally, they are coupled more than farther away. So, so there's recurrent excitation. And what about the spiking pattern? Why do, why, why do the spiking uh, patterns matter? Um, one reason is this that I said to ignore the leak term, but now let me uh, bring it back, okay? So if you keep pushing up, okay, and it tries to leak, but you push it up before it has, a, has time to leak, once you get it past threshold, it's past threshold. 
and then it can leak for a long, long time. Okay? As opposed to, I'm exaggerating here in these pictures, you push it up and then you most of it leaks away, you push it up, most of it leaks away, you push it up, most of it leaks away. Okay. So if so it's not so much the, the periodicity, but the fact that the, sp the spikes come in very quickly, like in very quick succession, is much more effective in driving the, uh, the, the membrane potential across threshold than if they are farther apart. So these are the, the reasons, okay. So now I'm really done with that and I'm going to uh, orientation selectivity, okay. So, so for V1 cell preferring vertical, Okay, so let's say this is going to be the picture throughout. Okay, so it prefers this this grading, and it's direction selective if it favors one side over the other. Okay, it either favors left to right or right to left, meaning that it responds a lot more robustly from one to the other. And direction selectivity, uh, so a little bit of background is that it's a neural basis for motion perception. It, it causes these eye pursuit movements in motion perception is something discovered in the 1960s and various explanations have been uh, uh, proposed for, uh, and I, I'll review some, some of that, but as far as we know, no satisfactory uh, explanation have been proposed for monkey, okay? But the, first, some experimental facts. Okay? Experimentally, it is found that more than half of the simple cells in the input layer for C alpha are direction selective, a very direction selective, a bit more than half. And it's not random for each cell. If it prefers one direction, then it's all going to always prefer the same direction. Okay. And the, it's broadband in terms of the spatial frequency and temporal frequency of the grading, meaning that it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, basically over the range that when spatial and temporal frequencies are too large and too small, the cell cannot see, right? It can only see a particular range. Within that range, it basically has the direction selectivity extends throughout the range, okay? And another important thing to repeat is that L individual LGN cells are not direction selective, okay? But, and there's nothing between LGN and V1 and V1 cells are. So the early ideas of uh, di explaining direction selectivity are focused on this idea of spatial temporal separability or inseparability, which means that X is space, T is time. So you show uh, a, a stimulus here and how would the, uh, what is the reaction of the, of the cortical cell? And people said that, well, this is separable, meaning that it's kind of independent. And this is inseparable. And this one corresponds to direction selectivity. And this is the, the kind of thinking that dominated a lot of the earlier work. So the questions that I would like to address are, how does spatial temporal inseparability imply direction selectivity? Okay, does it? And if so, why? But more importantly, what are the biological mechanisms behind spatial temporal inseparability? Okay. And here I want to emphasize that what I have to say uh, is for the macaque uh, is mouse, for example, is quite different. For, for, first of all, mouse relies a little bit more on the retina than the macaque. Uh, macaque uses the, relies very little on the retina for, for, for functions like direction selectivity. And also the, the connectivity is different, the cells are different, um, I mean the, the, the cell properties are different. So macaque, okay, think macaque. Okay. So I'd like to show you a proposed explanation for how it works. This is in a paper that uh, just appeared uh, not so long ago. Okay, so our proposal is that the LGN response summed over L, the, the, the sum over all the, uh, the four LGNs or four to six LGN cells that project to the same cortical cell is DS. So what this says is that even though the LGN, each LGN itself is not directionally selective, their combined response combined over all the cells that project to the same cortical cell that already contains a direction selective signal. Okay, so to, to uh, Here's how, how, how we found this. Okay, let's go to an ideal setting. Instead of two rows, let's just take two cells, one off and one on, okay? And the sum response is the response of the on cell and the off cell, okay? 
And then now let me cheat one more time. Uh, I showed you earlier about the input current to LGN. Let me confuse the input and with the output for LGN. It's not, a, it is, it's not exactly right, but it's not a terrible thing to do because LGN is known to be a fairly linear filter. So this is more or less right. Okay. So and now I'm going to assume the response of the on and off cells are just given by the convolution of the light intensity map with these kernels. Okay. And then there are two gradings okay. because there are only two cells. It either comes from the right or from the left. Okay? So this is a sim simple enough mathematical setting where one could actually uh, do things and even prove theorems. Okay? So the first thing to observe is that if you take a sine function and for grading, this is a sine function. Okay? If you convolve it with a reasonable kernel, then what you get is another sine function that's phase shifted and its amplitude is also affected. Let me not uh, worry about amplitude so much, but pay attention to the phase. Okay? Now, the key idea, and these ideas were already present in the literature, it's not, uh, I'm kind of saying it in the way that's convenient for me, but it's, it's not entirely new, is that there is a phase difference between the on and off cells because they are located, uh, they're, they're not in the same spot. So if you send a grading through the phase, that the phase meaning that this time shift relative to the grading is different for the on and the off cell. But I'm not so much interested in the exact phase of the cells, but in the phase difference between the on and the off. Okay, so this is my delta phi. So now, when when do I get the maximum response? Is when the when, when both of them are at the max. Right? When the response of the both so the response is like a sine function. So when the response of the two sine functions align, this is when they uh, when when the response is max, right? Uh, I, it's because the, there's a sign difference on and off a difference, so I have to choose a convention. So I'm gonna use a convention that delta, when the phase difference is zero, this is my convention, then that's when they both, the, the, they both have maximum response and this is uh, obviously the max, okay? So now from this, it follows that if you look at a grading from, from right to left and look at the phase difference, and look at the one from the right, you look at the two and see which one is closer to zero. The one that's closest to zero is the one that it prefers. That's very simple, that's all there is, okay? Easy fact, if the two kernels are identical, then the phase differences from left to right and from right to left are the same, okay? Uh, it's just by symmetry. You reverse the situation and you can translate your story line by line and you will see that they are the same. So what does that say? That says that the, the DS comes from the broken symmetry caused by different time kernels. Other things being equal, of course, right? I'm assuming a lot of things, okay? In my idealized setting, the way to break DS is equal to using different time kernels. Okay. And the way to, to create DS is to, to, to use different time kernels. I didn't say it would succeed, but you need this, okay? Uh, but more importantly, I can't just by hand change the time kernels to anything I like. I need a biology-based explanation. And so this is what uh, the theory that we propose says. So the proposed first mechanism is that there's a time delay of a few milliseconds, five, 10 type of numbers in the arrival of the on signal. And this is something that actually happened in the retina. In the retina, the on one is more direct. The off one, sorry, is more direct. And there has to be a sign inversion for the on uh, signal in the retina. Um, this, this, this has been known for a long time, causing the on signal to arrive a little bit later, okay? So it means the picture goes like this. This is on and off, okay? This one is delayed by like say five, 10 milliseconds. When the signal arrives, arrives here from on to off, Okay, if this one is delayed, then, well, it already gets here first and this one is further delayed. So it's a much longer delay compared to if it was arriving from this side, right? Because this one is delayed making the two signal closer. Okay, so this is the, the symmetry is broken and there's a chance of DS and we could test it. And it did, indeed it produces DS at high temporal frequencies, but not at low temporal frequencies. Um, well, actually it does too in low temporal frequencies, but you can't really see it, it's not perceptible because at low temporal frequencies, 
if the distance of traveling from here to here is really long, it's like it's a hundred plus and hundred plus milliseconds, uh, and you delay it by a few milliseconds, you're not going to see a whole lot of difference. Okay? So this mechanism works well at high temporal frequencies like 10, 10 hertz, but does not work well at temporal frequencies like two hertz. Okay? And uh, the cat, for example, uh, seems to prefer two hertz than over to 10 hertz, but monkey prefer 10 hertz. So in order, but monkey has temporal frequencies too at lower, uh, has DS2 at low temporal frequencies. So to do that, uh, I, I, we, we went to another uh, feature, which is found in the uh, data of Reed and Shapley from in the early 2000s. What they found is that the off kernels always, almost always look very similar, but the on kernels are sometimes like the off, sometimes it's a little bit taller. Okay, so this is, I've drawn in both the delay and the taller uh, on kernel, the positive lobe rather is taller, okay? And we found that this produces a phase shift, uh, same direction as phase shift as the on delay, but at low temporal frequency, so it fixes the problem. And I'd like to give you a sketch of a little proof for that, which you can really prove this, okay? Is that, so if the um, on kernel, uh, so the signal is like sign, okay? And the on kernel is equal to the off kernel like this, plus an extra bit in the positive part. Okay. So we talked about the off kernel being like a, like a derivative. So you take a derivative of sine, you get cosine, right? Okay. But if you average the positive part of integrating against a positive kernel means you average some. Well, then you get something times sine. Well, you add the sine function to a cosine function and you time shift it. And that's, that's kind of the proof. Okay, so mechanisms one and two together produce direction selectivity, but which direction does it? Okay. And this is something that in the idealized setting one can prove, okay? So the, what it depends on is this distance, D between the on and off cell. Let's measure everything according to retinal distances. So in degrees between that and the spatial frequency of the grading. Okay, so the preferred what what we what one could prove is that um, there there is a very mild condition on the uh, 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 from the last page that I did not state, but it's it's it doesn't really come in really. Okay, so what we could prove is that the preferred direction is it always prefers the same direction when little d is less than big D over two. At big D over two, it switches to the it prefers the same cell. It just starts to prefer the opposite direction to, it prefers the opposite. And then at big D, it switches again. And at 3D over two, it switches again. It switches back and forth like that. Um, this I think has to do with the fact that if you took, put two points on, on a circle and you look at the uh, distance, shortest distance between them, they, so there's a shorter arc, you move the two points farther apart, uh, suddenly it changes to the other side and back and forth and so on, okay? So the, the preferred direction switches at these points at basically N over two times the big D. Now, but this is worrisome because in uh, monkey experiments, there's no switching of preferred direction for each, uh, for any one um, neuron okay, that they measured. But then fortunately we checked and we are okay because as I mentioned earlier, each neuron, depending on its eccentricity can only see spatial frequency in a particular range. So for example, at about five degree eccentricity, uh, there's no response for spatial frequency bigger than five, five uh, cycles per degree. And that means that in order for, for this to, 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 to prefer consistently the same direction, this distance between the on and off cell should be no, not bigger than 0.1 degree. And fortunately, this is consistent with uh, anatomy. So is in mathematical theory, it should switch for the same neuron with the same hookup, it should change as you vary the spatial frequency. But for the monkey, uh, it, it seems that the, the whole range of spatial frequency that is visible to the monkey fits inside uh, one of these ranges. So you don't see switches, or at least that's what, what seems to be the case in 
all the things that we've seen. Okay, so this is the final thing that I would like to uh, address is that, okay, so the sum feed forward LGN inputs have DS, but that doesn't mean the cortical cells will have DS, right? Okay? I mean, once it, so, so you have your cortical cell, you receive a DS in this input, but as, uh, as we said, they, it, 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 there is so much uh, uh, interaction with the rest of the intercortical interaction. Uh, how, how would we know that there's still there gonna be any DS left after all that interaction? And this is the, the something a result in a recent paper on the bioarchive. And so, so I'm, what I'm showing you here is a picture of um, a, a plot, a CDF, black is from the model and green is from experimental data. Okay. So DS is measured as pref over op, and you will see that throughout is not something we invented. It means the firing rate in the preferred direction divided by firing rate of the opposite direction. And people usually use F1 because it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's like sinusoidal in, in, in nature. There's an up and a down. So they measure the amplitude of the sine function. So you use F1 in pref over op. And people usually think that a high DS cell, a highly direction selective cell is when pref is three times, fires three times more than op. Okay, so, so let's look in here in this picture. This curve is for simple cell. So when uh, at three, so this is three, when pref e uh, over op equals three, we get roughly like a data set is like 58%, I think, of the cells have that. And the model, whoops, back up model has like a little bit lower, but not too different, okay? And this curve is for complex cells. They are not very direction selective, okay? And there, there are reasons for that, but I'm not gonna get into that. Okay, so um, I, I, uh, I, I realize I'm gonna run over, but this is the last slide before, before, the, before the summation, okay? So, the, so what we found in the model is that if you look at a cortical cell, I'm gonna call it cortical DS, meaning the DS of the response of the V1 cell. Compare that to the DS of the input received by the V1 cell. We found that the cortical DS is bigger than the feedforward DS. Uh, now this is exactly something opposite to what we had worried about. We, we established that this one should have a fair amount of DS, but we're worried that this would get destroyed. But actually we found it is bigger. Not only is it not destroyed, it's bigger, okay? And I want to stress that in the model, there are no connections in the model cortex designed to promote DS. In many models in the literature, people have assumed the, for some reason or other, uh, the uh, uh, cells that have preferred the same direction um, are, are influenced by, there are special connections are designed to promote uh, that. I, we don't know if such uh, connections are there, but we use no such information in the model. So here's a proposed explanation. So, by, so now I have the model. I, I didn't know this beforehand. So we made the model, we found this, and we dig inside the model to try to explain this. And this is the explanation that I'm going to tell you. I don't know uh, if what I'm going to tell you now is true or not in the real brain. So I'm putting this as a testable prediction. Okay, just three points. Point number one, okay. In the, in the V1 cell, because the LGN input that it receives, simple cell, the LGN input that it receives looks like this, okay? It modulates the, the membrane potential on average also is higher during this period and lower during this off period. So there's a phase in the membrane potential of the recipient V1 cell that is dictated by the arrival of the LGN spikes. Okay? So, you can check that very clearly in the model and in any integrated firing neuron, this is true, okay? And uh, this is actually also true, I believe, in experiments as one could see in the plots. Uh, this is 100% true, okay? Then comes the next one. The next one says that intracortical currents are anti-phase to LGN, okay? Uh, this came as a little bit uh, of a surprise to my uh, neuroscience colleagues, okay? Uh, many of whom seem to think that the intracortical currents should be in phase to LGN. But if you look at the integrated and fire equation, okay, let's look at the excitatory current. Okay? It's equal to conductance, which actually we have checked 
is fairly consistent throughout. So it doesn't, it, it has a little bit of a phase, but very little, almost no phase. So think of this as constant times distance to reversal potential. So now reversal potential is way up here. Reversal potential is biggest when you are in the midpoint in the phase of LGN. Okay? So the e excitatory current is the biggest in midpoint to LGN. And you can do the same calculation for inhibitory, be careful with the sign, but it's the same thing. So what you will see is that cortical E plus I current is stronger, is larger uh, mid phase compared to, to zero and one. This is the LGN phase, okay? And if you do some simulations, you will find that day two, so this is the phase, LGN phase. This is the, the, the where, where this, the, this is the current. And you find that they're all gathered around in the middle. Okay, so they're anti-phase. So now what happens is that if you look at the in feed forward one is the pref for LGN divided by op for LGN. If you look at cortical one is the pref of LGN minus the, the pref of cortex minus because they're anti-phase because we are counting uh, F1 and they're anti-phase. That's why minus, okay? Now, what happens is that these two quantities, they're not completely identical, but they are very similar. So if you look at LGN, so this is for LGN, this is pref and this is op, it's like two times bigger, okay? And then you subtract off some two quantities that are roughly the same and you get these two, okay? okay? So this one got smaller and this one got smaller. But now when you divide by this by that, it gets much bigger. So basically if you subtract off a similar quantities from um, fraction, uh, it causes, it affects the denominator. When that fraction is bigger than one, like two, it causes the, it affects the denominator and causes the denominator to become small. And so the whole thing becomes big. And that's our explanation. So uh, if I could take one minute to summarize. Uh, so this is on the DS part. So DS is found in neurons in the input layer to V1, but not in LGN. So we need to explain that. And the proposal is that it originates from the spatial temporal differences in the on-off pathways and specific mechanisms proposed that are biologically grounded is there's a time delay and also a small difference in the kernel type, uh, kernel shape. Um, so th this difference is not so big. It's not like it's like 10 times or 100 times. It's more like at most two times uh, one over the other like that, okay? And then there, the direction of the preference depends, it depends a lot on the distance between the on off cells and the, uh, the, uh, the receptive field size, which also is related to the visible range of uh, spatial frequencies. And it's consistent with no switching in the macaque. Okay? And, but this is for LGN coming into cortex. Now into cortex, we implemented this in, in the model, in the model that we had built that worked for all these other things. And we show that the or, uh, we show that the feed forward DS alone is in, is already sufficient for producing uh, as much of the DS that you see you measure in the cortical neurons. This does not rule out other mechanisms. It's just saying that it's it's not like it's uh, it's it is quite adequate okay, in itself. Okay, and we found also that DS is in fact magnified in cortex through a very natural interplay of feed forward and intracortical currents. There's nothing, <clears throat> nothing was really done to bias it. The way they interact, it just naturally magnifies. And uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, uh, this is- Do uh, you want to go ahead? <laughs> that this is, uh, so these are my, these are my, uh, uh, my, my teammates. Uh, Bob Shapley and Mike Hawken, experimental uh, visual neuroscientist in Logan Charica. And this is the most of the work is funded by NSF since I talk mostly about the theory part the experiments funded by NIH and so on. Well, thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. So please feel free to ask why so many questions. Let's begin with the audience. Anyone from the audience have questions? So Jonathan, you can see that it'd be very interesting to connect with Kat, right? Yeah, I find this work extremely interesting. I'm, 
I find it very interesting. I mean, that's also part of over, I mean, other papers that you wrote that this kind of depends, I mean, to me, I have a lot of questions regarding, you know, the, the interest of, uh, of mean field models when we look at the numbers that you, that you, realistic numbers that you choose. And I mean, I, I mean, this work makes me think a lot. I don't have many questions to ask, but it's, I think it's uh, extremely thought provoking. I think yeah, it would well, be very but... interesting to compare between species, what happens. I from well, what I, I, saw... I, I should I should tell you that we have as many questions about this. This is very far from the end of the story. It's 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 kind of like it's it's come to a point when we have a story to tell, but there are also many, many open mm -hmm. kind of questions that I would like to answer. I mean, then I have questions that are a little more open. But so I, what I find interesting in this work is that you can find a fit forward explanation for this uh, dependence of um, direction selectivity to temporal frequency. Uh, but it is also known that movement and um, speed, temporal frequency speed, this is also processed in higher level areas also in, mm -hmm. in monkey and in particular uh, V5 or MT, I think in monkey. Yes, yes, yes. And there are some papers that also suggest that, you, that there are feedbacks directly from uh, MT. Oh, I, I, I would be the first one to tell you that this does not tell you what happens from the feedback. It does not rule out what happen, What the processing that happens later on, or the there is an enormous amount of <laughs> feedback, right? So we cannot model for 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 C alpha a bit less because it mostly gets it only directly from layer six. But layer six then collects from everywhere in V one, and V one talks to all these many other other layers, right? So it's a little, little bit less direct. Mm -hmm. But four um, B, which may be what you are thinking more of talks very directly back and forth with MT. Yeah. Yeah. But is it fair to say that the mo your model at least suggests that you don't need the feedback to have the V observation? It I can think, be... it, well, I, yeah. I, I, yes. It suggests that I don't need it to have it. It doesn't say that it doesn't feedback is not in play, right? It, yeah. Probably in 4C alpha, it is not the main thing. I think this is what a model says. For B, different story. Because the for B doesn't come back to for C out so 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 directly, right? But I mean somehow the uh, I mean, there's a big there's a big uh, uh, debate in the literature about whether uh, direction selectivity originates from the LGN or originates from cortex, right? Mm -hmm. It has to originate from LGN somehow. Otherwise, why would cortex know the <laughs> get the signal, right? But the question is, how much of it really is either one? I I don't think I don't think we have the answer to that. That's really that's really a great work. I mean, I, I like that. Yeah, I think it's just the first <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah, it seems a very rich model. And I really like, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hopefully we can see each other soon. <laughs> so do we have any other questions for Lifestyle here today? All right, I think we can just wrap up for here um, and I'd like to thank our speaker Lyson again for such a wonderful talk and everyone for your support and participation. So we will take a break and resume on December the 1st, next time we see each other. Okay, so take care everyone. I will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ying. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Good to see you.